Hello, my dear friends. We are going to read the memoirs of a German soldier who was a soldier in the 12th Panzer Division of the Waffen SS Hitler Jugend. The road home for Erhard Kincher was a hard one. Many German soldiers faced a choice after the lost battle for France die in pointless defensive battles without proper leadership or fight their way back home to Germany. Erhard and his fellows chose not to die yet and began to break through to Germany. But before we start, I would like to thank the sponsor of this video, Ground News. As you can see, it is important for me to study the events of the Second World War based on different sources. I have the same approach regarding daily news around the world. As the media narrows its viewpoint, it is difficult to get a balanced opinion. Ground News is an app and website that takes that problem away, allowing people to easily see how news is shaping across the political spectrum using objective data. For example, you can read the news about the supply of North Korean weapons to Russia, see who writes about it, compare coverage across the political spectrum, and you can also access an international point of view about this event, which is difficult to find. If you want to stay up to date with the latest news, compare coverage, and avoid media bias, register or subscribe using my link to get 30% off unlimited access. Once you try reading the news this way, you will find it difficult to go back. Well, now we turn directly to his memoirs. On the evening of July 8th, I was ordered by Oberleutnant Kaminsky from the 13th Company to take an MG-42 machine gun and, together with Hamper and a messenger from that company, cover the regiment's retreat. I put a belt with 300 rounds of ammunition around my neck and pushed another belt with 100 rounds of ammunition into the slide. We started on our way, the rest of the regiment following me as we advanced through the ruined buildings and passed an ammo depot that was burning in front of the church. In order to get a clear sector of fire for our MG-42, I came out of the northwest doors of the abbey, which was already under artillery fire from the enemy. There was a low wall in front of me, and behind it there was a meadow with hedges surrounding the edges. I took a look back and noticed my number three about fifty meters away behind me. I was eager to find out what was behind the hedge, so I climbed over the wall and headed across the meadow. I got under heavy fire halfway across and heard Hempel shouting, Erhard, go back, back! I fired a whole belt through the bushy hedge and then rushed backwards in zigzags, jumped over the wall and escaped the enemy's sight. We had a brief discussion and decided to make our way across the grounds of Arden Abbey to its northwest side. North of us, we were able to see the village of Cassay. The things we saw were shocking. There were so many enemy tanks and infantry there. In a short period of time, the company's chief of staff, Untersturmführer Kneipp, reached us. We could see the smoke over the area had gradually cleared and the enemy had captured the Ardennes. Although we hid inside the building, the enemy opened fire on us from the broken rooftop of the granary. It used to be our command post. However, the return fire of our MG-42 and a hand grenade forced the enemy to be silent. Then, when Untersturmführer Kneipp tried to take a look through a hole in the wall, a machine gun fire hit him in the chest. He was shot seven times through this small hole in the wall. My comrade Hempel pulled him to a shelter. In order to discern where the shooting was coming from, I stepped cautiously through the door and got close to that same low wall. As I came up to it, an enemy soldier appeared in my field of vision. I stopped, aiming my MG-42 right at his stomach. But unfortunately, the soldier was alone and didn't notice me. By the time we all got back to where Kanaip was lying, he had shaken hands with us all and died peacefully. We stayed in this shelter for a while, but there was nothing going on. I fired a burst of machine gun fire in that direction if I saw any suspicious movement and the movement ceased. As the dawn came, we heard the sounds of artillery and mortar fire, but thank God it was somewhere away from us. But it lasted not for long. Soon the shells came falling near us. We abandoned our shelter, and about 900 meters to the east we ran into our assembly point. When we showed up there, Sturmbannführer Milius asked me, Kinscher, what are you doing here? It was obvious that they had already put us down as dead. I was awarded the Iron Cross Second Class on July 20, 1944 for my efforts in covering the retreat from Ardennes. By August 19th, we had only 20 men left in our company, an officer, a non-commissioned officer, and 18 privates. We were ordered to move our two remained half-track all-terrain vehicles to the next village before noon. We were just about to set off when a Volkswagen raced past us and got its wheel into a hole in the road. 
When it hit the pothole, a pack of cigarettes flew out of it. It was shared quickly, and we enjoyed a cigarette before heading off. It was the last cigarette for many of us. After about 800 meters, we were caught under heavy fire. Both all-terrain vehicles were hit and disabled. I returned quickly to the village from where we had set off on my motorcycle and began to wait. Our officer admitted, I think that we are in a trap. Eventually, we decided to try to leave in another direction, in hopes of finding our command post. When we reached it, there were only two men left in our company. Later, when I was captured, I heard from one of my comrades, who had then passed that particular location, that the two all-terrain vehicles had been completely burned out. The corpses were lying everywhere and anywhere around them, charred, reduced from the heat to the size of dolls by the blast of phosphorus bombs. This was the death of the 14th Company. Kincher succeeded in getting on a passing three-ton half-track all-terrain vehicle with a 37mm gun on it and drove a little further until they ran into a huge traffic jam near a village. Once we reached the village, we understood what was the reason for the traffic jam on the approach to it. The enemy tank was positioned in the village on a height with a good view, and neither anything nor anyone could get past it. Some lieutenant was in charge. I asked him if there was something here that we could use to deal with the tank. Looking around, I saw a 75mm anti-tank gun abandoned by someone without ammunition. However, I recalled that I had seen boxes of shells somewhere along the road and sent a couple of guys back to find them. We wheeled the cannon into position to fire. The fact that I had been trained in the use of the 20mm cannon in the past was useful here, and with the second shell, we disabled the tank. The lieutenant found me to give thanks and pinned his own first-class iron cross to my tunic. A short time afterward, in the ruins of a house, he was explaining with the help of a map his plan for the breakthrough, which meant dividing the entire forces into two groups. There was a shot, and he fell down dead. Half of his neck was torn out by a bursting bullet. Some of the soldiers sheltering in the houses had lost their hope, but with a machine gun in my hands, I convinced them that there was a point in continuing to fight. I said to them to attempt to break through in a southerly direction, as the lieutenant had suggested. Then suddenly, a British convoy of supplies appeared right in our midst. Again, we engaged in heavy hand-to-hand -hand combat, and in this skirmish, I was wounded by a pistol bullet. I managed to escape behind some house, where I removed my tunic to see the wound on my chest. The bullet had not gone through. I pressed my fist on the entry wound to stop the bleeding, and quickly realized that I had been wounded in the lung. A while later, two soldiers appeared who were passing by. They handed me a dressing package so I could press it against the wound. By then, the battle seemed to have stopped. After about an hour, two more soldiers appeared and pulled me into the house where the doctor was. I was no longer able to move on my own because of the loss of blood. The doctor made me a very tight bandage and gave me an injection. There were eleven of us in the room in total. By evening, the doctor had managed to find a damaged truck with a straw floor for transporting the wounded. The ones of us who were still alive were put into the truck and we moved on. A few kilometers later, we came under heavy machine gun fire. The doctor waved a flag with a red cross, and the fire stopped. Then he went to make arrangements for us to pass unhindered, but he soon returned and told us that he had been refused. To make any further progress, we had to capitulate. We threw our remaining weapons into the creek and began to wait. The war was over for us. It was getting dark when two British sanitary vehicles arrived and drove us to the dressing station where we were examined by a British doctor. After the examination, a British captain came in with a priest and asked me what church I belonged to. The doctor told them that it was doubtful whether I would survive, and they wanted to give me last communion. However, the next morning I was still alive. I was loaded into a sanitary vehicle and drove to a more established dressing station, and then to a field hospital near Bayou, where I was operated on August 22nd. In early September, I was transported to England, where my treatment continued. I was treated with a total of 68 penicillin injections to beat the inflammation. But on October 19th, the doctors gave up again and again called a priest to my bedside. And again, I survived, and the strength began to return to me. I have to say that the treatment I got was excellent. That is all for today. If you enjoyed the video, please like it and support the channel by subscribing. Goodbye, everyone. See you all again.